Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the United States in the 19, into the 1940s and into the 1950s. So turning from, uh, you know, the, the, this world crisis that was World War II and, and the events immediately after that, we'll talk about what was happening domestically in the United States. So just generally speaking, um, before we get into real details here, as we talked about, you know, with the aftermath of World War II, the United States was in the best spot out of any of the of the major belligerents in the war. They were um, safe from destruction. Uh, you know, the only real attack was uh, Pearl Harbor. So the mainland the United States never had to worry about any destruction, uh, which was you know rampant across parts of Asia and all through Europe. You know, Great Britain had been bombed by the Germans, so they have rebuilding to do. France, of course, is destroyed. Germany's destroyed. Parts of the Soviet Union destroyed. Japan, all these places. Uh, and they have lots of economic issues, obviously, because of that. Um, but the United States, most of their losses um, overwhelmingly were, were soldiers, uh, enlisted and, and people actually fighting. Uh, only a little over 12,000 civilians who are all, most of those also attached to the war effort. So the United States is in this incredible position now um, because of uh, they are a creditor nation. There's lots of other nations that owe them money. Um, and the uh, war effort, that wartime production and putting people back to work had been sort of the final element to lift the United States out of the Great Depression. So when we get past the war, um, a lot of soldiers are able to come back. Um, a good bit of them are finding, uh, you know, really good employment. Um, you know, factories are, are bustling here. Um, there's quite a, a technology boom. Televisions are becoming more and more commonplace in households by the 1950s. So economically, things are, are, are pretty steady. Um, and on top of that, of course, what we talked about, world, uh, the United States has become this new superpower, this idea of a, of, a, uh, of a world power that has this incredible amount of influence all over the world. Um, and is offering economic aid to large portions of the world because of uh, the war um, in helping rebuild and also trying to thwart communism. You know, by offering aid, they're trying to keep uh, the Soviet Union from getting a foothold in these same places. So what is happening in the United States? So we talked about uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, uh, on several occasions here. He, of course, was the president through most of the Great Depression after Herbert Hoover taking over in 1933. And he was he was elected president four times. So his first one and then he was reelected three times. Had he lived through his last um, administration, through his his last term, he would have been president for six years. So that didn't sell well with a lot of people. And what had happened when we get to uh, Truman's presidency, uh, there's sort of a shift in Congress where it had been sort of dominated by Democrats. And now we have more Republicans in there. And they're looking at this thing of, you know, this is maybe not a great idea to have a, you know, president that can that can be reelected indefinitely, um, you know, that really kind of sets up sort of this dictatorship. Um, and so let's see what we could do about about limiting that. So um, the 22nd Amendment was passed by Congress in 1947. So they had a majority vote there um, and it is ratified by the states and becomes amendment in 1951. So it gets um, I think, is it two thirds has to have like a super majority in the House in Congress um, to uh, um, prevent a veto, because obviously you could see where a president might want to veto a law that's going to limit the amount of times he can run. So he doesn't, you know, it doesn't need a veto here. And then three fourths of the states ratify it. So what is in that legislation 
uh, basically part of the language there, it says no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice, and no person who has held the office of president more than two years of a term of another president shall be elected to the office of president more than once. So, for example, Harry Truman, um, who takes over for Franklin Roosevelt, um, three months into that final, um, or, uh, you know, the, three months into Roosevelt getting re-inaugurated uh, as president. So he served the overwhelming majority of Roosevelt's last, um, you know, last term. So he could only run one more time. Right. So he couldn't run another one because that would have been close to uh, 12 years himself had he had he tried to run again. Um, I think more recently. Um, so when John F. Kennedy is assassinated, for example, um, Lyndon B. Johnson took over with less than two years left in Kennedy in Kennedy's term. So he could have run for a, uh, he was reelected, and then he could have run again, but he declined to run again. So now we've put some constraints on how many times the president uh, can run for office. And quite frankly, I think that's a pretty good idea. Um, so as I mentioned, um, uh, Roosevelt uh, dies in office in April of 1945. And Harry Truman then becomes president to complete um, the work in World War II. So it's up to him to sort of finish. Um, they were, you know, knocking on 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 Berlin's door, um, and you know, when Roosevelt, it was very obvious that they were going to be victorious in Europe by the time Truman takes over. And the other thing, Truman, who had been a senator from Missouri. A uh, fairly long serving uh, senator, but had only been vice president for three months. He had not been Roosevelt's vice president in the in the prior terms. He's new to that executive office. So he has very limited amount of executive experience. Um, <clears throat> but so he guides the U.S. through the rest of the war. He authorizes the use of atomic weapons against Japan. Um, and he um, also, you know, helps guide um, the reconstruction of, of Europe. Um, he uh, puts together with um, George Mitchell, who's his uh, Secretary of State, I believe, uh, who was a who was a general during the war. He was a big player in during World War II. Uh, puts together what they call the Marshall Plan, which is this huge, huge aid package um, for uh, the countries that were um, devastated by the war. So namely Germany, they're trying to make a strong Germany that will not succumb to uh, communism. Uh, and then they extend that to some other places in the world, such as Greece and Turkey, uh, who are seeing some pressure from the Soviet Union. So they're trying to bolster those economies to keep them from falling to communism. Uh, and then there's other places as well. So um, that's sort of what's guiding Truman through the end of the 40s uh, and sort of this very early idea of the Cold War as the Soviet Union as the main rival that they're going to be dealing with for the foreseeable future. He was also an early civil rights reformer. So he um, kept hearing that um, black soldiers coming back from Europe were being mistreated. Um, you know, once they were released from their from the service, discharged from the service, and going back to their homes, and of course, particularly in the South, uh, these men were were facing violence. And military service had been tied to the civil rights movement for good reasons, even going back to World War I when you had uh, African-American soldiers that were coming back from, from World War I. Um, there's an idea there that uh, one of the ways that you express your citizenship is through military service. If you're going to sign up and, and uh, 
you know, give your life to a military service where you could lose your life defending your country, there is something very deeply rooted in that with your citizenship. And of course, when these soldiers were coming back after, you know, seeing what they saw and defending supposedly the rights of all Americans and then still being mistreated, they were getting super frustrated and, and angry that, you know, when it's particularly when the, the white kid coming back from Germany or wherever was heralded as a hero. Um, but then these men were, were getting treated just the same way they were before they left. Um, they were still subject to segregation. They were still subject to violence and, and things like that. Um, and Truman had actually heard about some of this and, and it, uh, it frustrated him and, and angered him. So one of the first um, things that he did was to sign an, an executive order to desegregate the military. So yes, the military in the 1940s is still segregated. You serve in a all black unit, you are, you know, um, housed, you know, with either white or black, you know, there's that level of segregation, just like there is, you know, similar to the Jim Crow laws. Um, and he starts the desegregation process after the war. And this upsets quite a few of uh, uh, legislators in his own party. So Truman is a Democrat. He is from Missouri. He's from the South as well. <clears throat> but some of those deep South um, uh, politicians didn't like this idea, didn't want to see desegregation. They're still holding on to the idea of segregation, want to keep the South segregated. So um, there's this uh, uh, split, there's a schism in the Democrat Party. And you'll hear a lot today, you know, people go on and on about how, uh, you know, making these criticisms of the Democratic Party as the, the, the party of slavery, right? Because it was, the, it was the party of the South. Overwhelmingly, that was the, you know, the, the, the party of, of, of slave owners and, 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 and Southern plantation owners and, even at this time, largely the people that wanted to keep the nation segregated were Southern Democrats. Well, here's where things start to split. Um, and they form briefly what they call the Dixiecrats. Um, and as you can imagine by the name, yes, they are largely all Southern states. Um, and they ran a candidate against Truman in the 1948 election. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Strom Thurmond, who was a long-serving senator. He, oh God, he, I think he died as a senator. He was still serving at that time, whenever that was, I think in the 80s or something. Um, but anyway, yes, he was a segregationist. Um, and I, they won all of, I think, three states, obviously, in the South with their Dixiecrat party. Um, but there's a little bit of turmoil there. It does, you know, sort of uh, hurt Truman's reelection, although he is reelected. Um, and uh, there's slowly, slowly an exodus from the Democrat Party of these segregationists. Um, many of them stayed, you know, Democrats in name. They started flirting more and working more with Republicans. And by and large, what happened is uh, as these Democrats died off, um, their children became Republicans. Um, and if you look you know, through a lot of, of our Southern states now, they are red states, right? They're, they're, they're Republican states. Um, Strom Thurmond, um, ironically, uh, was later found to have uh, fathered a, a mixed race child with a black lady. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, just, just just some of these people are just absolutely a mess. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's this division now that's occurring in the party, and it has to do with this idea of desegregating. So uh, Truman, of course, is also the president through the majority of the Korean War. He has to face this early Cold War crisis, um, has to remobilize and start sending troops to Korea um, to, to fight um, the uh, North Korean and Chinese forces there. 
uh, and along with that, so into the 1950s, into the rest of the, the, his final term that ran until 1953, and there's this panic in the United States known as the Red Scare. There was one earlier uh, before World War II, um, and uh, the Red Scare is this idea that communists are infiltrating the United States, um, whether it's through labor unions or you know, various other organizations, uh, and they're going to get this foothold in the United States, and you know, before we know it, we're all communists. You know, that's that's sort of the idea. It's just, they're everywhere and um, they're, they're going to turn us all into communists. And that is really manifested and personified by Joseph McCarthy. Um, McCarthy was a U.S. senator from Wisconsin. I believe he started his um, uh, his senatorial office in was elected in 1947, I believe, 46 or 47. And he comes to prominence by making these crazy allegations of um, communists infiltrating the White House, the State Department, um, um, was it Radio Free America, and uh, the military, mostly the U.S. Army. So, um, and the State Department, of course, is um, the branch. It's it's uh, so um, the 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 chief officer there is the um, Secretary of State, which is appointed by the president. It's one of those cabinet level off, uh, offices, and the State Department is basically our diplomatic office. Right, they're the ones that control embassies around the uh, the world. Um, you know, they they're diplomats. So, and Radio Free America is this um, um, government-sponsored radio and television network, basically, that's available around the world. Uh, it's, you know, largely propaganda, right? Um, but there's also, you know, concern there and the concern in certain offices in the army. So he makes this claim in 1950, and it sort of brings him to prominence. It brings him to a national stage. Everybody's looking for communists now. Where's the communists hiding? And uh, he uh, starts this investigation of the U.S. Army a few years later. I believe that happens in 1953, particularly with a, a certain core of the Army. Um, and they wound, wind up ousting a dentist uh, who had uh, been drafted. Now, if you're, you know, the draft is still going, right? We use this draft. Um, it started in... Uh, in, at, before World War One, we were ramping up for World War One. We started what's called the Selective Service. So, as a young man, if you're 18, still to this day, uh, as a American citizen, you go to the post office. Or I guess you do it online. I had to go to the post office when I was 18 and fill out a card for Selective Service, and that's basically a uh, um, puts me in the registry. So if there was ever a draft again, draft ended in the 70s, but if there was a, a, a conscription again where they had to start drafting men to go to war, then I would be, you know, I could possibly be selected. Anyhow, um, so uh, this one dentist had been drafted, you know, it didn't matter who you were. Elvis Presley was drafted you know, as a, as, as a famous, you know, musician in the late fifties. Um, but uh, you, you typically got a commission if you were a doctor or something. So you actually continue to be a dentist in the military. That would be your job. You weren't going to be a, a private or something like that. And they'd usually give you like a commission as a major or something like that. But anyway, so they, they did find that this guy had some sort of sketchy connections with Maybe or maybe not some organizations that maybe or maybe not had some communists, um, but, uh, you know, he just wanted to, you know, maintain his privacy. He didn't want to talk to McCarthy and all this stuff. So um, the army gave him honorable discharge. And um, but that sort of continued to sort of blow up this idea that there was this communist infiltration. So what brings McCarthy into really right under the public spotlight 
is the are these army hearings in 1954. <clears throat> so he had this counsel, this lawyer that uh, worked in his office from time to time uh, named Roy Cohn. And Roy Cohn had met a young man named G. David Shine. G. David Shine uh, was this um, Jewish heir to a hotel fortune. He was this rich kid and was, you know, extremely anti-communist. Like whatever this hotel uh, they had or hotel chains that they had, they put pam anti-communist pamphlets in all the rooms and all this stuff. And eventually he gets connected to Joseph McCarthy. Well, G. David Shine, like a lot of young men, and some dentist gets drafted and they push the army to give him some special treatment. Like not, uh, they don't want him to do like overseas duty. They want to try to get him a commission, uh, you know, so he can be an officer. He's not just going to be a private. And the army's just like, this guy has no qualifications for, you know, a, a commission. So he can do his time like everybody else. Um, and the army accused Roy Cohn and uh, McCarthy of, you know, uh, asking for special favors for this young man, which winds up with McCarthy holding these hearings, um, accusing the army of uh, interfering somehow with this, you know, this officer and blocking him from regular duty and all this stuff. Um, and it's 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 a big deal. So this is like the level, you know, we got the January 6th commission going on and there's all these, you know, trial or, or hearings that are on television. Same kind of deal taking place here in 1954. Um, you know, TVs, as I mentioned, are becoming more and more widely available. It's, it's pretty much a common household appliance at this point. Uh, lots of people have TV. So there's about 20 million viewers watching these hearings that are televised over about 36 days. There's like 30 different, um, uh, what do you call them? Witnesses that they bring in to testify. Um, and at the end of it, it basically clears McCarthy and the army. They basically say that, okay, neither one of you guys really did anything wrong. But McCarthy comes out on the short end here because he comes off as such a jerk to the American public during these um, hearings and the way he went after uh, you know, army people, army officers and, and soldiers. And um, uh, there was one uh, 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 officer, I believe, there's, there's a famous phrase that comes out of these hearings where uh, th this gentleman is, is attacking McCarthy and says something like, have you no decency, sir? Um, which you'll you'll hear from time to time to time, and 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 just really laid into him. So <clears throat> it tarnished McCarthy's star, and there he was censured by the the Senate, and um, he uh, just really lost his appeal that he had had with the American public prior to that. Um, you know, things really turned on him. There was this call to um, get rid of him, you know, get, get, kick him out of the Senate and all these things. So today, um, the word McCarthyism is, is often used, particularly when it concerns someone who's attacking, particularly public officials for un-American activities or being unpatriotic or being communist, whatever it is. Uh, and that's basically equated with the witch hunt. So, um, you know, th th this different forms have happened, you know, uh, not necessarily always communist, but if there's some other group that they believe uh, has infiltrated the, uh, you know, I, I think everybody in, in, in DC now is a pedophile. If you listen to certain groups or yeah, maybe aliens, who knows? Um, but that's always kind of attached to, um, you know, the idea when you when you are attacking a group. Um, the McCarthy tri or hearings are often conflated and confused with the House Committee on Un-American Activities, which was a different set of hearings in the late 40s that um, went after Hollywood and it went after a bunch of, of actors and um that they claimed were uh, communist. And it wound up getting, getting a bunch of, of actors blacklisted where they weren't able to work in Hollywood after they were accused 
of being communist. Um, but a little bit of a different time frame for those. Uh, and uh, as far as the um, who they were targeting. Uh, but you'll also you'll often hear those things kind of get mixed up from time to time. But it's all under this umbrella of, of this great fear of, of communist infiltration in the country um, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. As a matter of fact, uh, our next president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was accused of being a crypto communist by the group called the John Birch Society, uh, who were uh, extreme anti-communists, uh, uh, that he was a communist sympathizer. Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was an American hero, um, known for uh, uh, his role in World War II. Uh, he is elected in 1953, or serves, uh, I guess he's elected in 1952, becomes president, inaugurated in 1953, serves till 1961. Um, you know, short resume here, Supreme Allied Commander of U.S. Expeditionary Forces. Now you gotta be special if you're if, if supreme commander is somewhere in your title. Uh, that's later modified to be supreme commander Europe or yeah supreme allied commander Europe. Um, he was a significant contributor to the planning of D Day, right? Uh, Operation Overlord, the the invasion of Normandy. Um, <laughs> he served briefly after the uh, the defeat of Germany as that military governor. So he was the one in charge of that occupation zone that uh, the United States had as part of Germany. He's one of my favorite presidents to be completely honest with you. Um, most likely um, as was often the case with officers um, in this era, they were apolitical. They didn't care about politics. Um, you know, they served whoever was the president. That was who was giving them orders, and, and that's, you know, what they followed. There wasn't a lot of politics in the military in that day. In 1948, he's asked about, hey, do you want to run for president? He's like, nah, that ain't for me. Um, and likely did not vote until his own presidency. Um, and he was a moderate Republican. He was very realistic um, he uh, uh, had some some really right leaning people in his cabinet, you know, uh, people that worked for for him. Uh, but he himself was very moderate, and he wanted to balance um, growth and progress in the United States with this new role of the United States as this military power and and world world power with influence. Uh, he also uh, was the creator of the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody? Anybody ever heard of the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways? No. No? No? Have you ever been on I-270? Have you ever been on I-71? Yeah. Yep, that is part of the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. Any interstate. So in his time in Germany, one of the things that was really uh, uh, a, 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 uh, that they did well was road systems, and, and still to this day. So the early Autobahn, which was part of their sort of interstate system. And as you know, governor of uh, the German occupation zone, he saw this great highway uh, system that Germany had. And our roads, even in the 1950s, 1940s, our road system was really bad, you know, trying to connect the United States. And as I mentioned, you know, this is, we've, we've you know, crossed the, the, the continent, but um, you know, trying to actually connect everyone together was difficult with the road system. So he, this was one of his main agenda items. So um, he, you know, created this federal funding for states to improve their road system. And there's a there's a particular criteria to to meet to to have an interstate. So an interstate 
uh, there are no stop signs, right? There's no, there's no complete stop intersections. There's no red lights, right? It's, it's, it's constant. Uh, the entrances and exits, right, are, are so that you enter and exit the, the highway at highway speeds. That, that was the idea, to keep continuous flow of traffic. And every, it, it depends, but it's supposed to be like every other mile or ever, like every five miles, maybe, I think it might be like every five miles, you have to have at least one mile that is completely straight on your highway system to allow for emergency, um, uh, emergency runway that, that military aircraft could land on. Um, so, and um, I don't know if you got how familiar you guys are with that, but so um, the interstate system, here's, here's a little fun fact, some geography, uh, odd numbers on the interstate, uh, those interstates run north and south. So 71, for instance, that's a, a large, to its largest degree, it runs north and south. If it has a even number, they run east to west. If they are three numbers and it starts with a two, that's a perimeter. So like 270, right? It goes around Columbus. There's, there's, if you go to uh, Atlanta, I think it's 280 that goes around Atlanta or 281, 275, something like that. Um, but typically with three digit numbers, they're, they're close to a, a major city or something like that. Um, so that is largely one of his contri contributions to our country is, is the interstate system. That's why it gets his name. So next time you get on 270, just, you know, tell your family, oh, we're getting ready to take the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. Um, <coughs> so um, the other things that he had to deal with, um, uh, some more complicated matters than, than connecting our, our country. Um, was the Cold War escalating. Uh, obviously he's the president at the very end of the Korean War where we get a, and I shouldn't say the end, but the armistice that ends the act of fighting of the Korean War because the Korean War never actually ended. Um, but you know, this realization that we're gonna have continued uh, friction between us or the United States and the Soviet Union. This is gonna keep going on. But he's very concerned about balancing our national defense with um, domestic growth. Um, his uh, Secretary of State is John Foster Dulles, at least through, I think, the first part of his administration. Uh, and he offers this idea of a doctrine called massive retaliation, uh, wherein if you mess around, with the United States or its allies, really point more towards its, its allies. Um, <laughs> we're gonna turn your country into a smoldering radioactive hole. Uh, and of course, that's obviously aimed at the Soviet Union. Now, of course, during this time, the Soviet Union had begun developing its own nuclear and atomic weapons to test the hydrogen bomb. So it's, it has its own weapons it's developing as well. But the strategy was going to be that, you know, you say, you you know, start another war in North Korea or start another war in Korea or something like that. We're, we're going to sling every nuclear missile and, and, and nuclear weapon we have at you. Um, and it, it was sort of to kind of create this stalemate. Uh, and another term that comes along um, known as mutually assured destruction, which is what we live under in today's world um you know as 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 a as a, as a kid uh, as a generation x kid i grew up under the end of the cold war where that idea still prevailed um you know I, I, the, I, the the millennial generation i guess grew up under sort of this guise of, of terrorism uh, after after 9 11 uh you know, uh, but for me, it was, I was going to get, you know, uh, evaporated by a, a nuclear weapon. That, that was the big scare, right? The, the, the Soviet Union is going to, you know, destroy us all or we're going to destroy each other. And mutually assured destruction was this sort of strange balance between the two that, uh, you know, if, if we start a nuclear war, everybody dies. 
um, you know, if, if you start launching nuclear missiles, that's going to be the end of all of us. So it's this odd balance that's maintained. Uh, and there's ways that we, diplomatic ways that they have tried to engage that by limiting nuclear weapons and, and different nuclear weapons talks that from time to time have been successful. This is also why we, we get very nervous when a new country starts saying, hey, I want nuclear weapons too. Um, you know, North Korea, Iran, you know, places like that. Um, you know, it's very hard. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, if you are a country like this, you're looking at the rest of the world, you look at the United States, you look at Russia, you look at these places that have nuclear weapons, you're thinking, you know, why can't we have them? Uh, but we also try to do our best to limit that uh, because of, of the particular issue. Um, and there are plenty of nuclear powers um, today, India, um, Pakistan, uh, Brazil is a peacetime nuclear power. They don't develop nuclear weapons, but they use nuclear energy so they could very easily develop nuclear weapons if they wanted. France, Great Britain, obviously, um, Germany. Uh, so anyhow, you know, this is, this is very concerning. Uh, part of the problem, uh, Eisenhower sort of adds to the trouble with this idea of balancing domestic growth with national defense, what's shortly called the, the new look defense, which is the investment in nuclear weapons to um, uh, be able to bring, uh, to downsize the military. So, you know, what's going to cost them more are men and tanks and all this stuff. What's going to cost less is a bunch of nuclear weapons. So we can downsize the army by growing our, our nuclear arsenal, and that's going to balance the power. Um, and that gets all uh, the, the military, you know, the, everybody in, in, uh, in, in all the other services. So the Navy and the Air Force and, and the Army are all bidding to be this nuclear power. The Air Force is, is the winner in this time because they're, they have the, the major means to actually deliver nuclear weapons through aircraft and, and missiles. But the Army is investing in it. They're designing missiles and rockets and, of course, the Navy. They have submarines. They have all of this. Um, so that's where a lot of the, the money for the military is being spent is on nuclear weapons through the 1950s. They finally kind of come to their senses and realize it's like, well, are we really going to start a nuclear war if – you know, uh, this this communist friendly country invades another country. Are, are we really going to, you know, make them a, a smoldering radioactive hole in the ground? Um, and the realization that, you know, things around the world are not going to permit us to just be this this nuclear force. We're going to have to have a conventional, um, you know, army and a conventional navy and a conventional air force as well. Um, so by the end of his presidency, uh, he starts to, you know, sort of change his mind about those ideas that, OK, maybe maybe we went overboard there. And something that we actually looked at in class was part of his uh, farewell address in 1961, where uh, we get this term military industrial complex. So after, you know, this great investment in military technology throughout the 1950s, they're starting to look at, okay, we don't want this new sort of um, entity, this, this combination of private industry with government and the military to start having undue influence in our society. So that was what he exited his, his, his presidency with, was this idea that not that we don't need this military industrial complex, not that we don't need to ensure our national security and things like that, but we need to keep a close check. That they do not get too much power. So that, that was how he exited his presidency. Um, <clears throat> there was other things that he had to deal with. We'll talk about that. But he was a very realistic man um, and, and moderate in his politics um, and uh, was really uh, the type of president that was able to cross aisles and, and, and get things done. And of course, easily won a presidency because he had been this war hero. I think he, he won, he only lost nine states in his, his first run. Um, and those were Southern states. 
uh, and seven, I think, in his second. So very popular president. Obviously, he's a war hero, you know, somebody that they could just they could really put out there and, and knew uh, very little opposition to him uh, wind up being president. So continuing on here with um, other issues occurring in the 1950s. So um, the civil rights movement, again, you know, coming back from from World War II in the 1940s. One of the things that's sparking more frustration in the black community is, is the fact that you have these men coming back who some, you know, many died in the war um, and uh, had served their country and were still getting treated like crap when they came back to the United States. Um, and now we have uh, um, Eisenhower, who was continuing to press for desegregation. He had um, uh, um, continued to push for uh, desegregation in the military and in federal offices. So there's federal offices, you know, obviously across the country and many of those were still segregated. So he's pushing for this and um, continuing the work that the Truman had started. The Navy is, is hassling him about this, that, well, you know, there's, you know, regional traditions in our country that maybe we should keep and Eisenhower's like, no, that's garbage. We're not going to do that. Um, he, uh, one of the underlying reasons, now, uh, this is part of it. And it's not Eisenhower's main reason, but the Soviet Union is using that type of propaganda in the world, um, pointing at the civil rights issue in, in the United States. He's like, you know, hey, oh yeah, U.S. so great, this democratic uh, juggernaut and 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 this great influence in the world. But look how they treat their own people. You know, look at what they well, look at what the South does to to black people. Look at segregation in the United States. That's your great country right there. That's your world leader right there. And it became also a matter of national security that this propaganda was getting out there about segregation in the South, about Jim Crow laws. So it was also, um, it behooved the president um, to uh, start the process of desegregating uh, the country and doing as much as he could through executive orders, you know, to desegregate federal offices. He was pushing for the Washington DC um, uh, uh, school system to desegregate. And then of course, overall public opinion around the country is changing about it, which leads to um, this um, um, landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education. So background there, um, Brown, the Brown family had a young girl who was going to school, and I think they're from Topeka, Kansas, if I recall. And the uh, they lived on like the opposite side of town of where the black school was, right? So there was a segregated school system and it was just, it, it would be like for me living in Dublin, you know, to send my child to school, you know, somewhere on, you know, the Eastern side in, in, you know, the Eastern side of Columbus or something, there was a bunch of travel involved here. So they wanted to enroll her in, in the white school. It comes back to that separate but equal idea that Plessy versus Ferguson had established. It is not equal for this young girl to have to travel to the uh, the segregated school. So, um, you know, we're going to smack down that idea that she has to continue to go to that school or she can enroll in the white school that is closest to her. So it overrules Plessy versus Ferguson, which we talked about that was at the end of the 1800s, it was a ruling by the Supreme Court that made separate but equal law of the land. So now that with that Supreme Court ruling overturned, we're basically outlawing segregation across the country. And it's going to take a while. Um, because you, you know, you could change a Supreme Court ruling, you can't change people's hearts and minds. 
<clears throat> that's actually something that uh, Eisenhower said as well, uh, even as he's working, you know, towards um, uh, uh, desegregation and, 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 and civil rights, uh, he says, you, you can't legislate morality. So, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's the will of the people still going to create an issue here, and it does. There are instances across um, the South uh, in, in desegregating, there's violence, there's intimidation, there's harassment. Um, this also falls into when uh, universities desegregate, there's issues there as well, but I'm just pointing out one of the particular cases um, to and highlighting that. So again, um, uh, just, you know, th th this is one of the major issues and it was one of the ones that Eisenhower dealt with. So it's just one of the ones I'm, I'm happy to focus on. So it's this group called the Little Rock Nine and they're attempting to enroll uh, in a high school for the fall semester, the, 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 the beginning of the school year for 1957. And the state of Arkansas was attempting to prevent that. Um, they were gonna use the police force, uh, the local sheriff's office um, to block these, I think it may have been all girls. Um, there were certainly several girls um, from, from attending this high school. So as a response, uh, Eisenhower federalizes the Arkansas National Guard. Um, so, the National Guard is sort of like a um, our, 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 our modern day state militia. Um, it is largely equipped by the federal government. Um, you know, many, uh, you know, uh, veterans will, will come back and serve in the National Guard if they, after they've been on full time duty with the army. Um, you know, you'll see commercials and stuff about it. Basically, uh, you know, serving the National Guard is a, is a, is a part time job. Uh, you serve, I think, two weekends a month and two weeks out of the year to get training and 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 do stuff like that. Um, so then they get called to active duty. If there's a crisis, uh, they serve in war from time to time. But usually, what they get called out for are like natural disasters. Um, and the governor of a state has the ability to call it the National Guard, you know, if there's a severe flood or if there's a hurricane or, or you know, wave of tornadoes or something like that, they'll, they'll activate the National Guard to have them come help and, and, and provide support. Um, when they're federalized, um, they're put under the control of, of the federal government and the president. Um, and that usually means they're, you know, they're going to do overseas duty, you know, they're gonna support and fight um, or, you know, there's some other crisis. So in this case, Eisenhower activates the Arkansas National Guard, federalizes them, and he also calls in the 101st Airborne um, to protect these nine students as they attempt to desegregate this high school. So the picture here is from the cover of Time Magazine, uh, and you see paratroopers at Little Rock uh, along with National Guard for, for these nine little girls so they could just attend high school. And this was not the only situation. Um, I, I forget if it was whether, I, I, I'll, I'll try to find out here. Uh, another situation where I think Secret Service were involved and they were basically protecting a girl or it was U.S. Marshals maybe uh, protected a, a, this girl for like a year while she went to her school. And it was the same thing here. This, this wasn't like they just were there one day. They were there for a long time uh, ensuring that these girls were okay when they went to school. The only problem here though is that they can only protect them for so, you know, in, in certain instances. Those poor girls were still harassed and bullied and threatened with violence. One of them got trapped in a in a bathroom stall while white girls were trying to set her on fire, throwing burning paper on her in the stall. Uh, so it, it just, you know, Eisenhower's doing the right thing. Um, these girls obviously are not doing anything wrong, but again, trying to change the, the, the morality and will of people to do this as taking decades. And a lot of that, again, goes back to the Civil War, the memory of the Civil War that we talked about, and the failure of Reconstruction to snuff out these ideas, these, these longstanding ideas. Um, that might be about all I have here. I also just want to point out 
uh, this banner on the on the top of of the Time magazine here, talking about Atlas in flight, first caller pictures of the ICBM. So that stands for Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Um, again, the two things that uh, are are at the really on people's minds in the 1950s are civil rights movement and nuclear war. Um, all along, I will say that um, the 50s were an uh, incredible economic time of progress for the United States. Um, you know, high or, or low unemployment rates, um, great advances in technology and things like that. Um, but underscoring all of that were some of these incredible issues of the day. Okay, so that gets us through most of the 1950s. I want to follow up on Monday with some other sort of uh, Soviet scares, um, not necessarily the Red Scare, not not uh, related to uh, communists in the well, in a way, um, communism in the U.S. Uh, but we're quickly heading into the '60s, uh, where we'll talk again about some more civil rights issues, and keep moving on here. But we are getting much much closer to finishing um, the uh, the history portion here, and today in particular. Uh, we, we, we sort of came for full circle because we looked at some of those things that we had read in essential ed uh, and otherwise dealing with civil rights, uh, dealing sort of with the military industrial complex. And um, is there any questions on Eisenhower, Truman, or the 1950s? Okay. In that case, let's take a break to about 125, a little over 10 minutes, uh, and we'll finish out the week with some grammar today, working on verbs again in special cases. So I will see you guys at 125 for language parts. All righty. Bye-bye.